coming to you all this morning. This is a wonderful um, turnout. I'm very, very pleased. It's lovely that um, you know, we have so many people interested in the natural areas of Tribana and other parts of the East Coast. But of course, today particularly um, about the shore birds. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the place in which we live and where we are today and pay respect to the elders past, present and definitely future. And of course, I would particularly, if he's not running out the door, <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you don't know me, I'm uh, the campaigner of BirdLife Tasmania. It's a state-based community group of uh, volunteers. Um, it's part of a national organisation called BirdLife Australia, which is Australia's oldest national conservation organisation. It was founded in 1901, the same year as Federation, so it's been for, around for almost 120 years. Um, we are uh, in Tasmania. Our emphasis is very much on protecting Tasmania's birds and their habitats. Um, you'd be quite aware of the, the multitude of threats and issues that we have in, thank you, uh, in Tasmania too, um, you know, that are threatening our birds. Uh, and just this morning I was talking to somebody about our orange belly parrots where we're down to three wild, three females left in the wild. So, you know, things are grim with some of our species. Um, I'm also at the University of Tasmania. Um, I wear many hats, we all do these days. Um, I teach undergraduate ecology. Uh, I'm also supervising high degree students. So I've got five honours, masters and PhD students all working on birds at the moment. So I'm trying to generate that next uh, generation uh, of, of researchers working on Tasmania's birds. I was asked today to, to, to come up today to give a talk uh, about coastal birds uh, in the Glamorgan Spring Bay area. Uh, I'll touch briefly on, on the PROSA. Um, that's something that uh, I've been involved in now for many, many years. Um, but I also want to just give an overview of the birds that we're talking about on our beaches. I hope by the end of uh, my talk um, that I will change some of your people, some of your minds about uh, the beaches and our birds on beaches. And I hope that um, after today, you never go to a beach and look at the beach in the same way uh, ever again. I want to change the way that you um, spend your time and think about beaches. Um, during the talk, if I say anything that doesn't make sense, um, put up your hand or throw something at me, whatever, then I'll try and answer the question, as long as it's not too sharp. Um, and then um, if it's something I'm going to talk about anyway, I'll just say, look, I'll talk about that next. Um, otherwise, I'll try and answer the question there and then, and then obviously we've got questions at the end of the uh, talk as well. So, today I'm going to talk about four species of birds. Um, these are the true shorebirds. So, if you've spent any time on beaches in Tasmania or in other parts of Australia, you'd be familiar with some or all of these. Hooded plover, this is the bird that I've been working on now for 35 years on nothing between everything else. Um, mapping the distribution of these uh, birds around Tasmania. Close relative is the red cap plover, which we have uh, on many of our sandy beaches. This is a species that is quite happy to go inland as well, so it's not, it's, it's not confined to our beach areas. It'll work in, it'll breed on farm dams. Um, we've actually got them as far inland as Tunbridge. The, if you've ever been to the salt pans at Tunbridge, um, you'll see these little guys running around breeding quite successfully. The, the salt environment of Tunbridge is actually close enough to a coastal environment that it actually mimics the, the, the marine environment uh, inland, 100 kilometers from the, from the, uh, the coast. Um, if, and then you've got pied oyster catchers and close relative to sooty oyster catcher. The pied oyster catcher nests on sandy beaches, the, the um, sooty oyster catcher nests on rocky foreshores, and many of the offshore islands. So, um, it's a way for these two species to separate uh, and not compete with each other for, for coastal resources. 
Um, I'm also going to mention um, two other species. These are seabirds rather than shorebirds. Um, I'll talk about terminology in a minute. Um, if you spend time at the, the crosser in the last couple of years, you've seen the fence up. The fence is there to protect these guys in particular. These are fairy terns. These are half the size of the, if you're familiar with silver gulls or familiar with the crested terns, if you get big flocks of these uh, birds on, on our beaches, um, the, the, the fairy tern would fit comfortably in the cup of my hand with a little bit of the tail sticking out, a little bit of the bill sticking out. That's how small they are. They're a migratory species. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the crosser uh, colony there. There is a close relative, but this is the little tern, which is even smaller. It's not much bigger than a hooded plover. So if you're used to seeing terns on beaches, you can see those big mobs. If you're ever up at Scamand, you might see up to a thousand crested terns on, on the sandbar there. Different species completely. These are very small birds, fairy tern, little tern, their names imply their small sizes. And these birds, the reason I include these is that they are, uh, they nest in the same places as the hood plovers, the pygorista catchers. They share the same threats that these uh, other species do. And so I've included them because it's part of the discussion about uh, coastal management and, and how we're going to protect our beach nesting birds. So talk about shorebirds and different people use different names and this is part of the confusion sometimes in the community about what is a shorebird. You know, other people talk about waders, other people talk about waterfowl or, or other names. So what, what I'm just going to say here for you today is I will talk about shorebirds in the past, they've also been known as waders. Um, they, and the ones I've just shown you, the pied and sooty oyster catchers, the hooded and red capped plovers, breed on Tasmania's coastlines. There's a whole raft of other shorebirds in the world. Um, there's, it's a widely distributed and very successful group of birds around the world. In other parts of Australia, you get things like um, jacanas, the lap of the spurring plover that you all have in your gardens or on the edges of the road or on the football field is actually a shorebird. It's modified its behavior to take advantage of the fact that we're giving it all this habitat. It loves short grass, but in, if, in the absence of humans, the mass lapping, the spurring plover, would normally be feeding on the foreshore. It's a shorebird or in flooded areas. It's not um, something, it's simply taking advantage of us making habitat available for it, making food available for it, and they're going to respond. We're not talking about herons, egrets, cranes, cormorants, any of those birds. Just because those birds might occur on the shore or in the shoreline area doesn't make them a shorebird. The shorebird has a very specific uh, reason, uh, a, um, a very specific uh, focus, and it's those birds that feed while wading in shallow water. So if you think about when you go to a beach, you'll see these birds walking along the water's edge, picking away at food particles as the tide's coming in, or if there's something that's been stranded on a, on a falling tide. Um, and we use them as coastal canaries. You're all familiar with the story of how the miners would take canaries down in cages to give them an early warning about the buildup of bad gases um, in the coal mines back in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. So in the same way, we are using shorebirds around the world as coastal canaries. They're giving us early warning signals about the way that we're managing or mismanaging our coastal areas. And the loss of these birds, the loss of diversity and the loss of the numbers of these birds are telling us that our beach nesting birds are in trouble and we need to do more to protect the birds that we have got left. And particularly so here in Tasmania, <coughs> as you'll see, um, given the significance of our populations here. So one of the messages that I want you to, to get from today is to think about beaches and foreshores as critical habitat. In the same way that you've got birds that can only survive in jungle or rainforest or in eucalyptus or grassland, there are birds that can only survive on beaches. Take away those beaches, take away those birds' access to those beaches, they will not breed successfully. We're starting to see things like pygoras catches nesting inland away from beaches. I think at Tribato, I think three or four years ago, we had a pair of catches nesting on the, on the sports ground. Those birds struggle to get those chicks away. And more often than not, they have zero breeding success when they're forced to nest anywhere away from those sandy beaches. So we need to recognize that these coastal areas, these sandy beaches that these birds breed on is critical habitat. And we need to think seriously about how we're gonna protect that habitat. 
On the mainland, beaches are closed to protect hooded plovers and fairy terns in particular, the two species that are of greatest concern um, in Australia at the moment. Here in Tasmania, other than a few community groups that put up fences, uh, the fence that we've had at the, uh, the Prosser River, um, for the most part, there is no interest by government. Uh, it's only community groups that are doing anything to protect our beach nesting birds in Tasmania. So, um, the long term, I've been um, walking, doing surveys on beaches now for, I don't know, for about 35 years. Um, the long term data sets all point in the same direction. We have fewer birds on our beaches than we did 20, 30, 40, and 50 years ago, and we have a a lower diversity of species. So there's fewer birds of fewer species. We're losing our birds on our beaches. And if we're not careful in only 10 to 20 years, because that's how rapidly some of these species are disappearing, we will have beaches without any birds left on them at all. And already we're starting to see some of the beaches, particularly in the southeast of Tasmania, as more and more people spend more and more time on these beaches. We're going to, we've already seen complete loss of hooded plovers or penguins or any other species on those birds. We're back to, well, we're, we're down to uh, a sterile bit of sand with nothing on it except the old gull and people are out there uh, having a picnic lunch or something like that. And I would argue that's not the sort of beach uh, or foreshore that we want in Tasmania. Unfortunately, <laughs> nesting um, uh, inside a national park doesn't actually help these birds either. Uh, and in fact, in many cases, the emphasis on putting people into national parks, such as Fresno, such as Mariah, we're actually seeing the loss of birds inside a national park is actually faster than birds outside the national park. And you think that those parks were originally declared to protect biodiversity and to ensure the conservation of those species into the future. And they're now, because it's such a magnet, because it's so much focus on um, putting people into national parks, they're actually in a worse state than the surrounding areas, which is a paradox. It's not too more, and it's just not, um, it's just not the way that you would expect it. And unfortunately, as I say there, in many cases, the rate of loss of these birds is actually accelerating. It's getting worse faster. You know, even though we know so much, we know so much information, it's just not, um, it's not helping the birds uh, on the ground. So for the last 20 years, I've been walking beaches with a GPS. I started working on hooded plovers back in the early 1980s. Uh, and since then, we've been, um, the whole idea of the project is to come up with a, an estimate of the breeding population uh, here in Tasmania. For many years, we had believed that Tasmania was the stronghold for many of these species of beach nesting birds. You go to beaches in, in Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, there's nothing on those beaches. So Tasmania, was believed to be the refuge for these species and the stronghold that this is the last pocket. And when we lose them in Tasmania, that's it. There's nowhere else for these birds to go. So I've been um, doing the surveys, doing the, the mapping, doing the, the census of the populations and trying to get a handle on what we believe to be the, the population sizes of all of these birds. And basically it means walking beaches. So I get dropped off at one end of the beach and get picked up at the other end. A lot of people think, oh, great job, wouldn't, love to, you know, wouldn't you love to do that? Kill up for your job. Um, there's been days where I've walked 28 kilometres on a soft sand with a headwind the whole way, and I really wonder why the hell I'm doing some of this stuff. Because it's all done in voluntary capacity. I'm, no one's paying me to do all this. So, what can I tell you? Some idiots walk all those orange bits. So, starting at Straw, all the way up the west coast, all the way across the top, all the way down. I've done all of Flinders, all of King. Um, last summer I spent time with the Truana Rangers on Cape Barren Island working with them to survey Cape Barren Island. This summer I'm going back, I'm going to get onto Clark Island and then start doing some of the smaller islands in the Fermo group. There's 103 small islands in the Fermo group. I've done six, I've got another 90 something to go. <laughs> Um, done a lot of work up here in the northwest around Robins Island, Perkins Island, uh, for the wind farm, for the uh, for the big proposed uh, Robins Island wind farm. Um, I'll be back on Fli uh, on King Island in um, November doing more surveys, and then do the west coast from um, from Storm all the way up to the Pineland River. I need to get that done again this year. It's a few years since I've done all that. So we try and do this every season. It's only breeding season uh, counts that we do. It's the whole focus is to come up with an estimate of the breeding population because that's the key to the survival of these species. As I mentioned with the orange-bellied parrots, we're down to three breeding females in the wild. The population can have 50 or 60 birds, but if there's only three females, you've only got three breeding pairs left in the wild. 
And so with the hooded plovers, with the pied oyster catchers, what I'm doing is I'm mapping the numbers of birds on the different beaches. The information is shared with Parks and Wildlife Councils. I mean, the, um, the dog management plans for the, um, for the Glamorgan Spring Bay Council, the, the no-go areas for wildlife are derived around, not always, but you know, many times, uh, distribution of birds on those beaches. We've identified the, the key breeding areas for, for birds in beaches uh, around uh, the, the municipality. I've been fortunate to get a few people walking beaches uh, on the west coast. So from um, again Cape Sorrel all the way down to southwest Cape and then southeast Cape. Uh, one of my students did that for me, saved me seven days of walking the south coast track, for which I'm very grateful. Um, but the reality is, you can see, you know, every year I'm walking around about 300 kilometres of beaches, um, trying to do these beaches on about a five-year rotation. So theoretically, you know, the um, each beach gets counted. Um, uh, every five years or so. Um, I just make the, the comment that Tasmania's coastline is just a tad under 5,000 kilometres. Our coastline is longer than Victoria and New South Wales coastlines combined. So if you think about the uh, Tasmanian coastline, lots of little nooks and crannies and headlands and beaches. If you think about Victoria, you've got 80 mile beach and then headland and another long beach. And so even though we're such a small island, we have a very convoluted, very complex coastline, and it means that our coastline is almost 5,000 kilometres. And I haven't actually tallied up how many kilometres I've walked over the last 20 years with all this. Um, and I don't know that I ever want to, actually. So, let me just go through the species for you, because this is what you've come to hear rather than me. So, this is a hooded plover. You're all familiar with little hooded plovers, hoodies as they're called. Um, it's one of the rarest shorebirds in the world. Based on global populations of all the other shorebirds that we have around the world, um, in 2014, the federal government listed the eastern population as a threatened species. Uh, at the time, they said there were 3,000 individuals out of a total global population of 5,000 individuals. They're only found in Australia, nowhere else in the world. If you want to see a hooded plover, you have to come to Australia to see it. Based on all the survey work that we've done um, over the last 15 to 20 years, we now believe Tasmania holds at least 750 pairs. There can't be any fewer because I've mapped 750 pairs on our beaches around Tasmania. So straight away, Tasmania holds at least half of the eastern population that's listed as threatened. So immediately, hooded plovers are internationally significant and of international conservation concern here in Tasmania. Am I changing the way you think about beaches now suddenly? So we have a concern now. You know, we've always believed that Tasmania was important. Here's the first evidence that says, well, Tasmania, Tasmania actually holds half the world's population of hooded plovers, of a listed threatened species. We know the population is decreasing. We know that um, the East Coast in particular, the beaches are, the, the birds are disappearing on those beaches. And some of the beaches uh, in the Southeast have lost all of their hooded plovers in the last 10 years. And even though the birds are breeding on beaches on either side, they can't go back because there's too much disturbance, dogs or development or something else going on in those, um, on those beaches. And Glamorgan Spring Bay, you know, based on the surveys up to the end of last summer, um, I, I'm aware of 270 hooded plovers in the Glamorgan Spring Bay municipality from um, uh, Hellfire Bluff all the way up to the Denison River. So we've got 9% of the global population of a threatened species is found here in Glamorgan Spring Bay municipality. So the, the municipality, parks and wildlife community have a responsibility for almost 10% of the world's population of a listed threatened species. And that includes the Prosser River. So here's just a, an old map from uh, an atlas that was put together in the um, mid 80s that shows the distribution of the hooded plover. You can see it's found up. This is the western population in WA. This is not threatened at the moment. The eastern population runs from uh, just in the, in the Great Australian Bight through Victoria into New South Wales. New South Wales has got um, 18 pairs of hooded plovers left on the entire New South Wales coastline. Um, there are some beaches in Tasmania that have got more hooded plovers on one beach than all of New South Wales combined. And then here, the smaller, the smaller map shows just the, the, the early days of the, the distribution of breeding around Tasmania. And again, even here, you can just see how, how big those circles are. So Tasmania, long recognised, but without much uh, concrete information until these sorts of surveys were, were undertaken. And this is what we're looking at. This is a typical hood of other nest. This is actually on Spring Beach about three years ago. Um, the birds, uh, the, the 
females create the nest, they push down the stern of the breastbone, they turn around a couple of times and they, they excavate a small shallow depression in the sand. Those eggs are small enough that they would fit in a teaspoon. So you know those little chocolate Easter eggs that you get at uh, Easter time, the little solid ones? Not much bigger than that. A little bit fatter, but not much bigger than that. As I said, they were fit in a teaspoon. That, that, those two chicks um, are about a day and a half old. They would sit comfortably in a soup spoon. That's how small they are. And they cannot fly for 24 or 25 days. And they, as soon as they're you know, a few hours old, they'll run down to the water's edge and feed on the water's edge with their parents. Parents don't feed them, they run down to the water's edge and start feeding. So people walking dogs, people driving vehicles, quad bikes, whatever else on the beach, just killing these guys left, right, and center. They can't fly and then um, uh, it's just, this is what you're up against. You know, a shallow nest um, and um, little guys that are essentially defenseless. And so here's a, a distribution of all my um, surveys of quarter plums. You can see pretty much, if you, if you mentally walk your way around this uh, coastline, it's pretty much the sandy beaches. Um, and they need to be relatively high energy sandy beaches. So inside the, um, uh, the Huon River, the Don Castro Channel, into the Derwent River, into the Pitwater Orioles and the Burn Ramsar areas, where you've, and Macquarie Harbour, uh, even though I've done surveys inside Macquarie Harbour, there's no good clubs. The habitat isn't there. There's very much an oceanic beach, very much a high energy uh, oceanic beach. Um, and here's an example of the data we've got for Marion Bay, for example. So this is Long Spit at Marion Bay. This is the Tasman Sea here. This is um, Porpoise Hole and heading Dun Alleys down here to the, to the southwest. And so you can see the, um, the mapping that I've got every year since 2001, 2002, up to 2018, 2019, I walked Marion Bay to map the distribution of birds on that beach. And slowly but surely over time, um, there's fewer birds nesting than there were 10, 20 years ago. And we've got historical data going back to 1982 for some of our beaches in Tasmania. And so when you start looking even farther back, or you're looking back 40 years, uh, the numbers, the decrease is, is essentially catastrophic in terms of the loss of birds on our beaches. Um, I'll talk briefly about the red cat plover. This is a close relative of the, um, the hood plover. We don't have any idea how many birds we've got of red cat plovers in Tasmania. They will, if, if, if conditions are bad on the coast, they will go inland. They'll find a farm dam somewhere, they'll find a gravel bed somewhere and nest there. Um, this is up on the, uh, the northwest coast, up near um, Deloraine. I uh, did some surveys up there. <laughs> Um, a few years ago, I had one of my honours students looking at the interaction between the hooded plovers and red cap plovers, and we found that um, the hooded plover was very much the bully. They kept the red cap plovers away from the best breeding areas, the best nesting areas. They kept them away from the best food resources on the beach as well. So we believe now that the hooded plover is, if you like, the dominant species on the beach, and the red cap plover is more of a generalist in where there's hooded plovers. They'll, they'll try and find other places to nest. And so they move around, they're much more of a generalist compared to the hooded plover, which is much more of a specialist. Just if you can see. <laughs> um, the, the males have got this wonderful chocolate brown uh, cap on the head. The female has a little bit of brownish uh, wash on the head, but not as strongly marked. Um, there's certainly uh, several half dozen pairs of these guys nesting on the mouth of the Crossy River. I've got to mention also there's about five, six pairs of um, hooded plovers nesting on the mouth of the Crossy River as well. And the mouth of the Crossy River, those sandbars and that area that we fenced off the last couple of years, is actually the highest density of nesting shorebirds in Tasmania. The numbers of birds that we have in that small area, you know, over a unit area, is the highest density anywhere in, um, in Tasmania. <coughs> And here's the red cap, and so you can see look at all those red dots all through, you know, up through the Murray Darling system, all around the Lake Air, well into the salt pans in Western Australia as well. So this is a species that we will almost certainly never get a handle on the total population of this species in Australia. Because they're a generalist, they're quite happy to, to, to breed around the coastline when conditions are good, but as soon as the conditions are get more challenging, they'll, they'll head inland and try and breed inland as well. And here's a nest of a um, uh, red cat plumber. Uh, this is up, at, um, up on the northwest coast, up near Burnie. Uh, two eggs, the females pulled a little bit of this um, seaweed uh, around the eggs just to give her a little bit of a visual uh, representation of where the, where the nest is. 
Um, some penguin footprints, you know, coming up. You know, so sometime during the night, the penguin would have stopped and had a bit of a chat with the red cat. Quite a bit of the local gossip. And I use this picture to show people how well camouflaged these birds are. In that photograph, there's a female red cat plover doing her nut at me, and she's exactly four meters away from me. And so when I get community groups saying, oh, we're going to do a, a marine debris cleanup or a weed you know, pulling session, and we're going to do it in the, in the breeding season, and they say, oh, it's OK, we'll fly, we'll see the nest, we won't disturb the birds. I say, OK, where's the bird? Come on. It's all these ones I've shown it to you. <laughs> Sorry, next one. Come on, yeah. So there she's there. Sitting on a nest, two eggs under, doing her nut at me. And so this is what I reinforce to people. Yes, you'll probably hear the birds, you'll hear them screaming their bloody heads off at you, but there's such a good chance that you know, community groups wanting to do the right thing in terms of cleaning weeds or marine debris or something, there's a really good chance you'll actually end up doing more harm than good by disturbing the birds. And that's why we've got everyone now into this thing about um, cleaning up beaches, marine debris, we've got the aquaculture industry, everyone's doing it in the winter time now, rather than the summertime, so that you don't have these sorts of encounters. You like that picture? <laughs> Do I change the way you think about beaches? <laughs> These guys. Um, again, one of the rarest shorebirds in the world. When we do our surveys around the country, and we've been doing them on off now for almost well, 50 years here in Tasmania, um, we can come up with about 10 to 11,000 birds maximum. And you think, well, that sounds a lot. That's all of the pyrus catches in the world, and they're all here in Australia. Um, Again, Tasmania holds at least half, if not more, of the breeding population uh, of, of um, pyrus catchers. Um, in fact, in some places around Tasmania, their numbers are increasing, uh, and we believe that's mainly due to improvements in water quality. The Derwent River in particular, the Derwent Estuary in particular, the last 30 years, there's been a lot of effort to get rid of the heavy metals, to get rid of all the rubbish that's put into the water from um, the paper mill. I can't think of the company now. Lossy Skog, thank you, um, without pointing fingers. Um, so all these companies that used to be able to just dump their rubbish into the, um, into the and, and their discharge into the river are now not allowed to do so, and so the water quality has been improving. We've now got these guys nesting up the river as far as Cadbury's. So in the 30 years since I started working on these guys, the, the, they used to nest as far north as the Tasman Bridge, they now nest all the way up to Cadbury's. So they've moved those 10, 15 kilometres up river in 20 years as the water quality improves, as the habitat improves for them, and then breeding successfully up there. Um, a couple of years ago, two summers ago, I was at Marion Bay and came across a, a bird that we had banded. Um, the bird was still alive, still breeding, and she was 34 years old. So you, when you go to a beach, see, I'm going to change the way you guys think about beaches. When you go to a beach and you see a pair of pie whisk catches, you think, hang on, those birds were there last year. Well, they were there five years ago when we were here. Almost certainly. If you go back 20 years, almost certainly it's the same birds that were there 10, 20, 30 years ago. And you think if, if and 34 isn't necessarily the oldest bird, in, what's the oldest bird known in Australia at the moment, I suspect they could probably nest, uh, live for longer than that. Um, there are oyster catches in Europe that have been recorded 39 years of age. So if you think 34 years ago, that's the mid-1980s. How much has Tasmania changed? And how much has the coastal areas of Tasmania changed since the mid-1980s? But you wonder how many chicks they raise, because we've got one pair on our beach, yep. and we've had one pair since we arrived 16 years ago, but we never get it, you know, we see babies, and then we never see more adults. So either they're going somewhere else once they, you know, the get parents, adults, the parents will kick them off the territory. They aren't no, surviving. Yeah. And the, these birds, um, with all birds, um, there isn't any reproductive uh, senescence. So these birds, so in humans, we, we stop being able to breed without IVF, you know, somewhere at a particular point in time. Birds will continue breeding. So there's there's albatrosses on Midway Atoll in the Pacific 
uh, the oldest bird there is 63 and she's still laying an egg every two years. So these birds will be laying their eggs from about age six or seven to age 35, 36, whatever. Every year they'll be laying two eggs. And so, yes, the, this is the big concern is even if they're laying the eggs, are they getting their chicks off successfully? Certainly with wooded plovers, no. With pied oyster catchers, probably some of the time because we're getting an increase in the population and the population is moving to areas where it wasn't 30 years ago. So at least there's some indirect evidence without monitoring every nest every year to suggest that some of these birds are at least getting their youngsters off. And, and, but they kick them out as soon as, you know, as soon as they're old enough to fly and look after themselves. Um, the parents will kick them out very quickly <coughs> at the end of the breeding season. Um, and again, so again, based on the surveys that we've done, I've walked all the beaches in, in Glamorgan Spring Bay, uh, we've got around 430 pugwheels catches. So that represents about 4% of the global population. And as the populations decrease on the mainland, so the Tasmanian population becomes increasingly important. And so Glamorgan Spring Bay might be 4% now, but I suspect within five to 10 years, they'll be closer to seven or eight percent. Population will double proportionally compared to the rest of Australia because we're losing our high risk catches uh, on the mainland. And again, here's the distribution. You see they're up as far north as Cape York, all the way around um, Australia. But you think we've got as many high risk catches in Tasmania as the rest of Australia combined, and probably more. So even though they're widely distributed along the coast, Population is very much concentrated here in Tasmania. And if you spend any time uh, around Four Shores, more so in the winter time, you're more likely to see these guys. These, uh, the sooty oyster catcher is a close relative of the pyrus catcher. It nests on offshore <coughs> islands and rock stacks and rocky headlands and coastal areas are much harder for me to, to survey. I, I, I've been very slack. All I do is walk beaches to do my surveys. Um, walking, surveying the, uh, the rocky foreshores is much more challenging, much more dangerous. Uh, and so I've, I've spent most of my time doing the, the beach surveys. What we have done with sooty oyster catches is that we collect information on their numbers during the winter time. When all the birds come off the islands and they form these large flocks, sometimes in association with pie oyster catches, sometimes just by themselves. And we've counted large flocks around the southeast and in particular the northwest of Tasmania. And in some cases, we're getting flocks of over 2,000 sooty oyster catchers in the wintertime before they disperse again to their island breeding locations. So, based on those winter counts away from the breeding islands, again, we know that Tasmania holds almost half the world's population of sooty oyster catchers. So, hooded plovers, high oyster catchers, and sooty oyster catchers, Tasmania holds half the world's population for those three species. And Glamorgan Spring Bay has breeding populations of all of these species. Uh, here's just a distribution again. Uh, again, you see them all the way around the coastline of Australia, but Tasmania has as many sooty oyster catchers as the rest of Australia combined. So disproportionately, we're much more important than the rest. Now, uh, they're, they're the three um, so the four true shorebirds I mentioned earlier in the beginning that I was going to talk about um, fairy terns and little terns uh, because we've got these nesting on the um, on the Prosser River uh, sandbar. In fact, a lot of the um, the discussions that have been held between parks, mast, birdlife Tasmania Council has been around protecting these guys. Um, these are now listed as a threatened species under state and federal legislation. And I'm on a national workshop, a national committee um, that's looking at whether we need to uplist these things to endangered or critically endangered. In the last 10 years, the population has crashed 90% around Australia. In the last five or so years, the Tasmanian population has crashed 80% in five years. So we're actually losing them faster in Tasmania than we are on the mainland. The population is in dire, dire straits. And so you know, one of the reasons that we've put so much energy into protecting uh, the fairy tern colony on the Prosser River is it's the southernmost colony for the species in Australia and the southernmost colony for the species in the world. And so it actually has international significance. The mouth of the Prosser River is recognised internationally as what's called an important bird area. And so it is recognised internationally for its significance for beach nesting birds, primarily around the fairy terns but also for the high density of wooden plovers, <coughs> red cat plovers, and high oyster catchers. You've got a percentage of birds there at a density that's found nowhere else in Tasmania, 
and it's found um, nowhere else, and so it's been given this international bird area significance or status, and so the effort has been to, to protect um, uh, these, uh, this colony. All the work that we've done in the last 20 or so years we've, when we've mapped all the, the colonies around Tasmania, we now know that about a quarter of the colonies that these birds were recorded using up to about the mid-1980s no longer exist. There's now coastal developments, there's, or the beaches are gone, or something's happened. So we they, we can document the loss of a quarter of their breeding habitat just in the last 30 years. So that's certainly contributing to this decrease of 80% in the last five years. It's a long, slow uh, loss. We found a couple of new colonies, but what we don't know is whether those colonies are simply birds that have moved away from one site to the other because they can't nest where they used to nest. Um, they used to nest on uh, the neck of Adventure Bay on Green Island. They obviously can't nest there anymore with the, the sheer number of people on the beach. There's a few other beaches around the state where they can't nest anymore. So we believe at least some of the new colonies are new colonies and some of the colonies are simply birds that have been displaced from one side or from one site to another site. Um, and as I said here, the Prosser River colony is the southernmost colony in the world, so it has international significance. And the Morgan Spring Bay Council, between the Prosser River and another couple of smaller colonies up the east coast, supports 1% of the Australian population. So it's not significant in terms of global population, but it is significant in the Australian population in terms of numbers. But the fact that it's the southernmost colony in the world has international significance. And so we need to protect the, um, and again, that's part of the reasons for protecting the, um, uh, the colony. Um, as I said, these guys are small. So these guys would fit in a cup of my hand, a little bit of tail, a little bit of bill sticking out of each head. They're small, not much bigger than a hooded puddle. So if you're ever down at the Cross River or anywhere else um, on the foreshore and you see birds with a black cap and bright yellow bill and, and big tail about the size of a silver bell, it's a different species. They're your crested turns. We've got five species of tern in Tasmania. These are, you know, some of the smalls. And the fairy tern's got this black cap and sort of white forehead. You see how there's a bit of white between the base of the bill and the, um, uh, the black cap. The little tern, which we only have uh, between 10 and 20 pairs, you see that black comes down through the eye to the base of the bill. And you think, oh my God, that's not much of a difference between those two. We think these are what are called sibling species. It's one species in the process of slowly separating out into two separate species. We still get species, we still get mixed pairs of a fairy tern breeding with a little tern. So they're still not far enough apart to be separate species, but they're far enough apart that we can start telling the difference. They've got slightly different calls, slightly different behaviors, but we certainly uh, are recognizing them as separate species. At the moment, and in some years, I can only find two pairs of little terns on all the beach in 300 kilometers of surveys that I walk around Tasmania. You know, they are listed as uh, endangered at the moment, and there is a push uh, likely to succeed um, that these guys will be listed as critically endangered because they're just disappearing so rapidly from, from Australia. And you, know, you may think that I'm, you know, the difference between that white forehead and the black line, and the black line coming through, very subtle. I take lots of photos when I'm at a very term colony to make sure that I'm counting the two species. Last summer when I was on um, Cape Barren Island, I came across a large fairy term, uh, little term colony, about 60 or 70 pairs. I took photographs of every single bird to make sure I counted, to make sure there's no little terms that I missed in that, uh, in that colony. So, all of the surveys, all of the, the, the number crunching that I've talked about, all of the uh, information, you know, the, the so what question, well, you know, how can councils, how can parks and wildlife, state government, at least some, of the, some parts of the state government, um, have you know, concerns or how can they do what they need to do to protect our birds? And so what we've done is we've, we've broken up the Tasmanian coastline. I've, I've excluded the central north coast simply because that's just one large industrial area from um, Devonport all the way through to, to Burnie. Um, I have done surveys up there, but there's, there's nothing up there. Um, how can we look at statewide holistically and say, okay, where are the key areas for Tasmania? One of the areas that we really need to protect is this is the real strongholds, the hotspots for these species in Tasmania. And when you look at the, the, you know, the zones that we've got here and then the species here, and you know, just an arbitrary score of you know, high is one and, and otherwise not, and it turns out that pretty much the area from Bridport here in the northeast 
up through um, Muscle Row, all the way down the East Coast, Freysna, including Mariah, down to um, Hellfire Bluff and the bottom end of Glamorgan Street Bay. With Flinders Island, if you, if you think about it, if you fly over that mentally, it's pretty much one long sandy beach, the east coast of Tasmania, and so much of Flinders Island is pretty much sandy beach. So it turns out that the Ferno Island group and the east coast and that northeast corner are the critical hotspots for our beach nesting birds in Tasmania. Um, some of the beaches on the west coast um, are good for shorebirds, but the state government at the moment is pushing hard to reopen all the tracks that were closed for four wheel drives. Uh, we're working with the indigenous community because there's lots of indigenous art. I've seen some remarkable petroglyphs up here near uh, Green, Green Point, um, some of the, the earliest known petroglyphs in Australia. State government is looking to give uh, four wheel drive access from Burnie, Smithton, up here, Marawar, all the way down to the Parnham River along the coast to allow traditional access for wheel drive. <clears throat> so, I will give a very brief overview of the threats. I've already mentioned four wheel drives. Uh, we've talked about the, the Prosser River, the, the need to protect the, the Prosser River mm -hmm. colony. 85% of Australia's human population lives within 100 kilometres of the coast. We are a coastal society. We have been since day one, since first settlement. We have been a coastal society. And so, for all of us, um, the beach is no more than two hours drive away. And we have this mindset, what can we do at the beach? What can we do with the beach? And I hope today I've changed the way you think about beaches so that you now recognise beaches as a habitat in their own regard. I've had people tell me there's no way birds can nest on the beach because there's no trees there. You know, people will not accept the fact that birds just lay their eggs on the ground. And they're doing fine until we introduce cats and dogs and, and all the other foxes four-wheel drives, quad bikes, everything else. It's a habitat in its own right. And just because there's no trees there doesn't mean the birds can't nest there. I, I hope I've shown you that. There's been some really good work done at Deakin University over the last 10 or more years um, that have shown when people, just two people, one person stepping onto a beach, a bird will walk off its nest when you're 150 to 200 metres away. The shorebird strategy, because most of these are long-lived birds, as I said, pygris scatcher can live for 30 years. The strategy is I will sacrifice eggs or chicks because it's more important for me to survive and I can always lay another clutch of eggs. That's the strategy that shorebirds have around the world. And again, they were doing fine until dogs, cats, four-wheel drives, quad bikes, horses, everything came up on beaches. So we're slowly but surely breaking up our coastal areas, our beaches, there's, there's dog areas, there's um, commercial development, there's changes in vegetation, we're breaking up our, our coastal habitat. Um, four wheel drives, all you have to do is watch commercial television for one hour any night of the week and you'll see four wheel drives being advertised on a beach. Think about it, it's very pervasive propaganda, but you know, in the next week, just actually, well, it's, it's just a challenge watching commercial television anyway, <laughs> but try and watch it for an evening for one hour and you will see um, four wheel drives on a beach. And so it's constantly reinforcing this whole message about it's okay to drive vehicles on a beach. Um, horses, dogs and cats. Um, lots of people try to tell me that cats are a problem or the dogs aren't a problem or the horses aren't a problem. Um, you saw how small those chicks are, you know, the ones that will fit in a, in a teaspoon or a soup of the eggs in a teaspoon, the chicks in a soup spoon. Horse will crush them, but you won't even know that you've crushed a, a nest. Um, the, on the back table there, there's some um, plaster eggs that we use for the school kids. And when we do those eggs in real sand, we get everyone, you know, there's, we build a little nest and everyone can see the eggs. And if everyone to take two steps back, those eggs disappear. You just don't see them. They're that well camouflaged. Birds rely on that camouflage to protect them. Um, sea spurge, you got an issue, it's slowly working its way around Tasmania. Some parts of Tasmania has more than, than others. Um, efforts to pull out the sea spurge pose a risk, um, but also the fact that these, that these coastal weeds change the topography of the beach. It changes the way the beach looks, and so it's not suitable for nesting anymore. Same thing with marine debris, efforts to clean up um, beaches. Ecotourism, I'm I suspect that's more of a problem than we even realise. Uh, and then, of course, we have this whole issue of, of sea level rise that the state government refuses to 
to do anything about. So there's a whole raft of issues that are going to put more and more pressure on our coast areas, particularly on our sandy beaches, because the sandy beaches are the first beach and the first bits of the habitat to wash away in the coastline. Rocky foreshores, not a problem. Pebble beaches, not a problem. But sandy beaches, high tides, as you've seen, you know, uh, in the last four or five years, we've seen some exceptional high tides. And you get those big winter storms, sandy beaches disappear, and then slowly build back up during the spring and summertime. As those sea levels rise, those beaches are going to get washed away and they're not going to get washed. You know, they're not going to uh, rebuild uh, during the summertime. So just some pictures here. So this is sea spurge. If you're not familiar with sea spurge, it's a Mediterranean species that was introduced to Australia uh, through ballast water in South Australia and is now spread to Tasmania, Victoria, I believe it's in New South Wales. Two years ago, it um, uh, established in New Zealand, on the west coast of New Zealand. So the seeds are viable after two years in salt water, and in some parts of the east coast, uh, it sets seed twice in a calendar year. So it's it's a very successful invasive species. Um, it's a euphorb, it's a succulent, so it's got a very nasty um, a sap, and if you get that sap in your eyes, you're a hospital case for 24 to 48 hours, so it means you need the full safety gear for working with these uh, species. Um, so here you go, this is this pervasive uh, form of you know, Obviously, the look of euphoria with um, Dan and his kid here, they've just driven through a gull colony because here all the gulls flying around, you know, saying their eggs have just been crushed. Um, my dog would never heard of her. This is an orphan. This is um, Priscilla Park's wonderful photograph from 20 years ago. Um, she was on the beach doing some work on uh, high risk catches, and this guy comes onto the beach, lets the dog loose, and it ran straight to the oyster catcher. Now. That's an oyster catcher egg. That it's, that it's eating there. Um, this is one of my pictures from um, up the east coast, just north of Bishno, uh, a couple of summers ago. Um, I don't even know what sort of dog that is, but um, it just, again, off the lead, went straight after a group of clubs back and forth. 15 minutes later, the birds had abandoned their eggs. I found the nest, two eggs, and the birds never came back, so it was gone. Uh, and then, just you're all familiar, uh, the last 12 to 18 months, we've had a horrendous spate of dog attacks of penguins all around uh, the state. It's symptomatic of dog owners that refuse to accept that they have responsibility for their dogs. As I've said in the media any number of times, if a dog attacked a child, we wouldn't even have the discussion. The dog would be put down, the, the dog owner would be prosecuted. Uh, at the moment, um, they're at least finding some of the dogs that are killing some of the penguins, but we've now had six or seven dog attacks in the last 12 months and we're just losing our penguins. I haven't even talked about penguins today. I mean, that's a whole other story in itself. But again, it's symptomatic of just dog owners not taking responsibility for their pets. Uh, and this is me up on the northeast coast. Uh, there's a high risk catch nest you see just there, the two eggs. Um, and this is an area that's actually a designated four-wheel drive access area. It's up near Bridport. Um, but you've got idiot, and the word is idiot drivers driving 80 to 100 kilometers an hour on the sand and they came up this um, this little bit of a ridge here to get the vehicle off the beach, off the ground, that was the whole idea. Not realizing that we were just literally five meters away from where they were driving through. I mean, it's just, so I'm there, you've got sea spurge here all around, you've got tire tracks within two meters of the nest and you've got idiots who are trying to get their vehicles off the, um, uh, off the ground just for the photo opportunity. We need to do something more. I won't talk about this. Um, you're all familiar with the, um, the dog control or the dog um, uh, off areas, uh, exclusion zones, and dog on lead and dog off lead areas. So these are based on science. You know, we didn't come up with council and say, let's try and be as you know, nasty as possible to the community. We came up with recognised values. And so the areas have been identified as no dog zones. And they're identified as no dog zones, such as the orphan spit for a good reason, there's birds nesting there. It's critical habitat, it's sensitive habitat. We need to protect it. And this is something I'm now on this, you can go to this um, Prosper River <coughs> advisory group that's meeting next week. And I need to explain and try and get some support from members of the community who feel that their dogs are more important than protecting uh, nesting uh, shorebirds and terns. So, despite all this, and all of the information that I've told you today is in the public domain. We give all of our survey data to Parks and Wildlife, to, to, to Pipwick. We give it to the council. Some councils are wonderful. I will say 
publicly that the Northern Spring Bay is the most progressive coastal conservation management council, as far as birds is concerned, in Tasmania. We get more traction for Northern Spring Bay, mainly through Mel, but not exclusively, than any other council in Tasmania. Some councils don't even want to talk to us. Some mayors don't even want to talk to us. They're not interested in any of this stuff. It's all about getting people onto the beaches and having that beach as a resource. What can we do with the beach? What can we do at the beach? Not recognising that it's a habitat. And so, you know, this Great Eastern Trail that's been still promoted by the state government, where they're trying to expand on what they call the Bay of Fire success, where you have 3,000 people walking along beaches um, in a three month uh, season. I've worked with the Bay of Fire's people. Um, within 10 years, there won't be any birds left on those beaches. Too much disturbance, no breeding success uh, from the disturbance, the birds will disappear. When the old birds die out, that's it. So how much of this information is making its way into the schools? That's what I'm here for. Uh, we've done a lot of school work. Uh, we used to do a lot of dog's breakfast for dog owners uh, around the place. Um, we, try, we try and make as much information available as, as what we can. Whenever we do a community event, uh, we talk to teachers, we give them as much information as they can. Um, I've got to work with kids' cards, so I can actually go to the schools and do the presentations as well. Um, we do what we can. We're a community group of volunteers. You know? I'm trying to cut that to seven days a week at the moment and start working. Because um, <laughs> I'm about to start doing all my surveys again, as well as doing everything else. So we try really hard. I could just add that certainly in our area, Council and Parks have tried and yep. had lots of interactions with the schools in different shapes or forms, and I guess we do our best as well, but you know, we've done some of the hours in the day. We've always found our schools to be very interested and engaged and wanted to. <coughs> we used to do those postcard competitions yeah. where the kids would draw their you know, <laughs> designs and you know, we'd select 10 of them for postcard and things like that. So different. Different councils, different. Um, I did a talk similar to this on King Island, and it was a combined uh, primary and high school. And um, I was giving my talk, one of the kids just made some comment, oh, I just I ride my quad bike on the beach. And so I asked the student, a class of about 35 to 40 students, how many in the class had quad bikes? And every single kid, you know, age 6 to 16, had access to a quad bike. How many of you ride on the beach? They all put up their hands. There's no sense of the, you know, the values and the need for it's, it's very much something, because we are this coastal society and we've just been brought up to, to you know, there's the beach. Well, you know, it's, it's for recreation, rather than the habitat. We need to, we need to do better. Um, we had a discussion with um, uh, these people on Flynn's Island who are doing bird watching tours on quad bikes on the beach. If you have a look at their webpage, um, you'll see them riding about 60 to 70 kilometers an hour um, on the beaches and just weaving all over, just totally trashing the beaches completely you know, in, in, as ecotourism bird watching. Doesn't work that way, kids. Um, we're still fighting the Arthur Pyman stuff. Um, the state government essentially shows no interest whatsoever in doing anything about sea river rise or closing off beaches or anything else. Uh, it's just it's just not an issue for them and they're pushing hard to um, uh, to open up the beaches. Um, here's um, just a, a map of Mariah Island just to finish off with this ecotourism. So there's the sandy beaches, there's the Isthmus, Regal Bay, Chinamans and then um, soldiers and all the way up the west coast of the island. Um, that's John Gray's property. Um, Redden and Earl and Lagoon in there. Um, these are just pictures from, um, that's the Mariah Island walks. They're walking pretty good. They're supposed to walk single file close to the water's edge to minimise the disturbance to the nesting birds. This is Bay of Fires. Um, this is a picture from their webpage, so it's not me that's um, taking the picture. Um, and you know, again, they're supposed to be walking down, you know, down here on the wet sand to minimise the chance of stepping on nests, but obviously they're not. Uh, and this is one of my pictures from Mariah Island, probably about five years ago now. Um, I was following Bay of Fire, the Bay of um, the Mariah Island walks tour, and they're walking six abreast, basically just pushing all the hooded plovers, all the tiger sketches in front of them, and then pushed this bird into the. So these two outside birds are the birds that own the territory, and this bird's been pushed into their territory, and these birds are defending their territory against this intruder. And look at this, it's attacked it so hard, it's actually pushed the bird off its feet. That's how hard they're defending their territories. That's how precious these coastal areas are to these birds. 
And these birds run, you know, run the, the risk of injury. If they damage their wings, if they can't fly, they're dead. They'll starve to death. If they can't get away from predators, they'll starve to death. So we need to be very conscious of the fact of human disturbance on beaches. We need to be very cognizant of the fact that beaches are habitat. It's not just a resource. The beaches are there, the birds are using it, and if we don't look after it, we won't be, um, we won't have birds that on our beaches. So I, I hope today, this is my last slide, I hope today I have convinced you how special Tasmania is for our beach nesting birds. I hope I've convinced you of the significance of Tasmania holding half the world's populations for three of these species straight away. You know, we need to protect what we've got because we are the custodians for these species. They've almost disappeared on the mainland. If we lose them in Tasmania, that's it, they're gone from the world. And that means hooded plovers, pygris catchers, and city oyster catchers. As the human population increases, I mean, Melbourne is predicted to, to be larger than Sydney within five years. Um, as the human populations on the mainland increase, so will the populations of Greece, and so will the, the importance of Tasmania's birds increase. We are literally a refuge. We are literally the last hope for these species going into the future. And so we need to protect these birds if we want these things to survive. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'll just thank you all for coming today. Thanks to Parks, they've done a lot of support over the past. NRM was in the past. Many private landowners actually let me walk through their properties to get to the beaches. You saw that map around Tasmania. Not all beaches have got access um, from, from the roads. And I'll leave you with one of my favourite birds on a beach here at, um, uh, that's here at um, Crossing River. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So along with giving these birds a status um, that, that you mentioned, does that not come with some sort of regulations about how the areas need to be looked after? So it's not. Yeah, I mean yes, the answer is um, if there if a species is designated to be endangered, so something like fairy turn or little turn, or fairy turn is about to be upless, um, the government then is required to repair some sort of management plan or conservation plan or recovery plan, you know, to, to ensure the survival into the future. Those things aren't being written anymore, and even if they do exist from past years, they're not being enforced, there's no resources. Um, I'll take my head off to all the parks people that I work with around the state that will put up um, fences to protect or signs to protect. During the breeding season, you go to Mariah Island, there's usually a little fence on Darlington Beach to protect a pair of hoodies you know, on Darlington Beach. Um, about four years ago, somebody handed their towel. It's a convenient way to get the sand off their towel over the sign that says this is a yeah, threatened bird species. So yes, there are obligations, but there's no resourcing, there's no commitment, there's no interest by the state government to do anything. It really, the conservation of these birds around Tasmania literally depends on councils and committed community groups to do so much of the work and you know where we do have supportive parks and wildlife staff. So it, 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 there's actions happening, but it's a bottom-up approach rather than top-down. Yeah. Um, I've always been really interested, and I've only heard this through you over the years, but the idea of territories mm -hmm. and how, and that, like, that last picture you sh showed the, the pilots to catch it going to the other one. Um, Cross River have been a really good example of all that. Now you've got sandbags mm -hmm. that have reduced foraging habitat mm -hmm. and potentially reduced breeding populations. The number of breeding population pairs that can use that habitat. Um, I guess they often get thrown out that the birds can just go somewhere else, but there yeah. isn't necessarily no. anywhere else for them to go. No. And, and I've had that many times that well, if they don't like it here, they'll just go somewhere else. And the reality is they can't. That all the available territories and habitat are being used either by another pygoist catcher or another species. So no, these birds have distributed themselves around um, the beaches where the food, where the nesting habitat, where there's safety for them. And if they're pushed away from one area, no, they, they won't go anywhere else. They'll, they'll basically die because they don't have territory they can feed. 
So yeah, we've, we've seen a change in the numbers of birds at um, the Cross River, and obviously we'll keep monitoring those going into the future to see what the long-term changes are. Remember the pygros catches can live for 30 years, but they may not have any breeding success for 20 years, you know, with, with too much disturbance. And so you need that long-term data set to actually show the consequences. Please. Where do these birds go in the non breeding season? They stay on territory. So the hooded plover, red cap plover, pygros catcher will stay pretty much on the same beach that they breed on. The territories become less well defined and they become less well defended. But sometime in July, early August, when the days start getting longer and their hormones start kicking in again, they'll suddenly become more defensive, more territorial, and re establish the, the territories. They don't establish the same territory as the year before because the beach has changed from one season to the next. Beaches are some of the most dynamic landscapes uh, components on the, on the planet. And so they will, through the winter time, they'll be feeding away. They'll see, oh, there's a nice little you know, patch of food over here, or the waves never get to this beach, and so uh, this part of the beach. And so they'll, they might change their territory, you know, sometimes only 50 or 60 metres, sometimes it might be two or 300 metres. It just depends on how that beach is reconfigured <coughs> during the winter time. The fairy terns and little terns, some of them stay in Tasmania, some of them just head back to, to the mainland, some of them will go up as far as uh, the Coral Sea and, and into the uh, Indonesia part of New Guinea. But for the most part, um, uh, they'll stay around uh, Australia and then um, it'll be a function of We're not sure exactly what, probably the um, temperature conditions, whether they cross back straight or whether we have increased population in Victoria and a decreased population in Tasmania for one year. So those hooded plovers, pygros catchers, red caps are uh, dependent on those beaches every day of their lives. Mm -hmm. And for the pygros catchers, 35 years or 34 years, every day of their lives, they'll be on that beach. Yeah, so it's... Uh, when's the best time to try and get rid of the sea spurs? Is it conflict with the birds? Which time? And so um, we've got the aquaculture industry now doing the marine debris cleanup in the winter time. We're slowly working our way around um, uh, community groups and councils so that if there is a sea splurge cleanup, like there is up at um, uh, Bay of Fires, um, Laripuna, uh, every year, it's in July. Um, if there's no birds on the beach, you can go there anytime. Um, and we're in the process of putting together some maps that just have simple traffic light systems so that if there's uh, a green, you know, single green circle over a beach, basically means you can go there any time of the year. So, yeah, we, we're trying to develop these maps statewide at the moment. When the young become um, at the age where they can breed, are they having to be finding their space? Yes, and so what's happening at the moment is that um, what we talk about the age of first breeding in pyrus catches is normally four or five years, you know, based on old studies back in the 1980s. Um, some of the recent work suggests that some of these birds may not be till 10 or 11 years of age before they can start breeding for the first time because all the territories are full. And so what's happening is that the population has been breeding successfully for pygros sketches and what's happening is all the territories are full and so they have to wait for an older bird to die or some other way for a territory to become available uh, before they can start breeding. So there's now a bit of a waiting period, which is another bit of evidence that we use to infer that the breeding success is increasing and the population is increasing in southeast Tasmania. But again, you need those 40 year data sets that take 40 years to pull together. And again, it's being done by volunteers. All right. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. There's material and information at the back of the, um, the hall as well.